as I was just saying, the description that you received as a catalog is not exactly how the next three weeks are going to go, but I wanted to show you just a general uh, overview of the only a three week class and, and then we'll really dig in on the material today. Because a topic of a dream city or an ideal city, and there are books and exhibitions that use either title, both of them referring to a concept of a city in some way far better than anything that has ever been actualized. Um, that's a theme you could spend certainly a full year investigating because I think wherever there have been non-nomadic societies, there have been dreams of what would be the perfect urban center. Uh, so what I'm doing is picking out a sort of a constellation of ideas from the Middle Ages, then the Renaissance, and then from the modern. So that's the, the, the three weeks. And of course, we're concentrating on, I would concentrate on the points at which this, this idea, this longing, this uh, scheming for the perfect uh, environment intersects with some kind of physical reality because we'll be looking at the physically real. It's, I say that because one of the early, really important um, texts for thinking about this in the Western tradition is Plato's Republic. But he's interested in the ideal society in the city, um, the social classes, the way property is divided. Um, in a, he's not... Um, concerning himself with, with an actual um, concrete physical um, construction. So we put him to the side. So what sources do we go to? Well, the Bible. Um, the Both Jewish and Christian scriptures refer especially to the ideal city of the New Jerusalem. And that's what we'll concentrate on today. It's, you can call it, and it is called the heavenly Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem, the celestial city. And then in Christian thought, it um, segues into just calling it heaven. Uh, so <clears throat> there's, there's some fluidity about this. And the primary, I'm going to, we'll start probably with, probably, I know how we're going to start. We're going to start with illustrations of some texts, biblical text, and then we'll move into the architecture. But um, it really goes back to Ezekiel, who, after the destruction of the first temple um, by the Babylonians, in his prophetic writings, describes what the new temple will be and the new city, the new Jerusalem. And he describes it in a complete, explicit description. The way parts are laid out, the exact dimensions of it. And it evidently seems to most biblical scholars that what Ezekiel was describing was a new Jerusalem um, envisioned as something that actually physically was going to be built. Well, of course, the, um, the temple which had been raised by the Babylonians, that was rebuilt. But even in later prophetic writings, there seems to be a sort of a, a development from not so much talking about the, the city itself, the, the actual stones on, on the hill, Jerusalem, um, it began to have more of an eschatological meaning about a city at the end of time, a kind of a, a perfected city. And then, and so when there's mention of Zion, that 
that would be another way of talking about it also. So it's in the Psalms. It's, it's just scattered throughout um, the Old Testament. Then uh, when the Romans destroyed the second temple in 70 AD, the developing Christian thought came to the fore because after all, that's the became the dominant religion in a couple of centuries. And the main text then becomes um, St. John, who, who writes the book of Revelations, the last book in the Christian scriptures, in which he describes the new Jerusalem. Uh, so we will be looking at that. And... the way it's visualized on earth. That's the primary content of today. Then next class, there's a, a wave of thinking in the Renaissance and in the, up through the 17th century maybe of um, a different configuration, not, not, not to bring a, a new Jerusalem to bring that down to earth in some way, um, but instead to have a, a humanist oriented city, a, a classically oriented city, which is going to be extremely rational, extremely logical, as you could see in this Renaissance painting of a, a concept of an ideal city with the, it's, you see, it's not totally bilaterally symmetrical, but it's extremely clearly laid out and based on classical principles and the image itself is very symmetrical. So logic, order prevails as if that's the goal of an ideal city. So there are many uh, Renaissance writers and artists and architects who, who exercise their imaginations about what kind of city could be built that would be this new ideal form. So here would be one example. And you see again that now looking as an aerial view that it's extremely logically um, presented. But then the one that I thought would be to the extent possible, very interesting to look at is Leonardo da Vinci's ideas about it because he was not so much interested in the ideal city as in the practical realities of Milan, where he lived, in which was a quite squalid, medieval, overcrowded city that had suffered terribly during the plague. So Leonardo, with his always untrammeled mind, decides to redesign the city and uh, so he comes up with an idea for a city that's going to be on, it's a, a two-level city. Um, the elite are on the upper level and the workers are on the lower level. But he designs a, a new sanitation system, a new um, road circulation system. Um, he, he just takes the form of the city. Of course, it never went anywhere other than his drawings. But it's a very interesting to see the way he's um, freely working it out as here on this one page. Now there may be time to say hello to several 17th or 18th century rationalist dreams, but I don't know about that. I do for sure know that uh, we will in the last lecture look at early 20th century ideas of the ideal city. <clears throat> They're prompted by the, of course, the tremendous growth of cities that industrialization brought with the concentration of people and there's new transportation, new technologies, new materials using a lot of steel and glass. And um, so that, that spurs a lot of visionary thinking. And this is Le Corbusier's um, idea. Now, he did not himself produce this model. He did drawings on which this model is based. And 
There is something of that still messianic quality to it, though, because he gave it the name, that radiant city, um, that idea of um, light and enlightenment um, that's biblical. So this is his concept of it, uh, this very rational, symmetrical, still layout with great multi-story skyscrapers, and then it spreads out into smaller blocks, uh, moving from the concentration on trade and culture into suburban living, and then don't really remember where manufacturing was going to go. And this is one of his views of it too. And he's dreaming of transportation for the future. So there would be raised roadways and um, they just zoom right through the center of the city, as you see here. Then these are all apartment complexes. He had an opportunity to build a sort of a version of one of these. And also in India, in Chandigarh, to um, experiment with his ideas in providing the designs for a new government complex. Um, there are a later stage of his work, but we can see some of that. And then his American rival counterpart, Frank Lloyd Wright, who you see sitting here in the middle over his great uh, model with uh, I think a visitor and one of his um, students of a city that he designed, which he called Broadacre City. And there are two of his very lovely drawings for it. It too will be very carefully zoned. And he also designed a mile high city as a very theoretical vision of just one tower where the whole city would be contained. But we'll look at those in detail at the end. So that's your three weeks. But we're dealing primarily with the celestial city today. And I say that, and then I show you this, to which I imagine a lot of you say, oh yeah? This is a painting by the contemporary German artist Anselm Kiefer, and it's called the Heavenly Jerusalem. It's big, it's um, more than seven feet across. And um, he worked on this over a decade, the late 1980s to the 1990s. It has his characteristic, some characteristic motifs and his characteristic combination of many materials. There's um, silver foil in here, and then there's uh, shellac, and there's some paint, and let's see what else does he have? Lead and salt, and under this canvas. The reason for bringing Anselm Kiefer right to the fore instead of waiting, doing it in some sort of chronological order, <clears throat> is that Kiefer has his own idea of what the heavenly Jerusalem is, but his work is certainly evidence of how it is still a living, vital idea for people. His Jerusalem, like a lot of his work, draws on this sort of a, a core theme. So one is about Jerusalem. As a German who was born in 1945, um, there's a great deal about World War II in his thinking, about the Holocaust. Um, he's very interested in both Northern and classical mythology and biblical stories. So these all get woven together. Now what here would be um, even possibly other than the title associated with the Jerusalem, one is a harshly critical content you can sort of find in this. When you think of these receiving diagonals and see how they cross here. Don't they look like they're railroad lines? So of course that reminds you of people being taken to the camps. Which is what, for the Nazi idea of a cleansed society, a pure society, 
an ideal society. But there's also a possibility of reading this in um, a way that's very contrary to that because you could also see this like ladders that are just lying on the ground and looking into the distance. And that has a kind of a biblical association with Jacob and Jacob's ladder because Jacob had the great vision. In his sleep, he saw a ladder between heaven and earth and the angels were clambering back and forth. So that's the idea of Jerusalem in Kiefer's own, his own mythology as what now we would say is liminal space, the, the place between the earthly and the heavenly. I'm gonna look at something else, it's early 20th century. Uh, there was a huge, were um, attending the lectures on Russian art, might recall this, uh, because this is a, a painting on glass. It's very modest in scale, but it's by Vasily Kandinsky when he was just on the threshold of moving into abstract art, where in this painting, which is of an apocalypse, he very much had a, a, a sense, as did a, a number of the people he worked with, that they were living in an apocalyptic area, that that. And he had a wholly robust, optimistic view that um, the destruction was going to bring something great and that there was imminent destruction, whether it's then turns out to be the Russian Revolution or uh, World War I, but just that change was in the air. So here, what he presents is, is a scene um, sort of, of well, he, he was a Roman Catholic, and this draws on the Russian Roman Catholic imagery to a great extent. But of it all, the parts to let's see, there's even Christ on the cross here. Here's an angel blowing the bugle, raising people from the dead. It is the city up here, this onion dome city next to the rising sun. That's heavenly Jerusalem. And that he will continue to abstract in a number of his works so that when a person becomes expert in sort of deciphering his more abstract works, you can frequently see, oh, here's that Jerusalem. Here's that Jerusalem. Here are those motifs that they keep recurring. but we're going way back now into medieval art and looking at visualization, visualizations that often occur in uh, manuscripts of the apocalypse. Now this is a, it's called the Bamberg apocalypse because it's in the German city of Bamberg. It, it's not wholly an apocalypse because here is seen some Christ life. There were additional pages. And this is a modern facsimile. I think you can tell from the binding. This isn't quite, doesn't look quite medieval. But it was on um, sheepskin, I believe. And it was a book prepared at the very beginning of the 11th century for the king of Germany at that time. That's, it's called the Ottonian era because the three successive kings names were Otto. So there's Otto I, Otto II, and Otto III. Well, probably for Otto III, this book was created. And here's one of the illustrations, a full page illustration. And it's an illustration of the text from St. John in the book of Revelation. So I'm going to leave that image on for you while I read the fairly lengthy text that was so inspiring for centuries of people. Uh, so the angel is, um, John sees the whole, the collapse of the world and he, he moves into the heavenly realm. 
But in this one part, he says, And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And one of the seven angels approached and spoke with me, saying, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he took me up in spirit to a high mountain and showed me the descending holy city, Jerusalem, which was laid out as a square with three gates on each side. Mm -mm, not textual. Doesn't agree with the text here, right? Um, as a square with three gates on each side. At each gate was an angel with the name of one of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, each with the name of one of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who was speaking with me was holding a golden, golden measuring rod or reed, they say either way, to measure the city, its gates and wall. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement. Now, I don't know what that would equal, but something that is 1,500 miles to a side, the cubits have to be pretty big. Uh, the wall is built of jasper. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoperis, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each of the gates is a single pearl. And the street of the city is pure gold, transparent as glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. See, this is text was written just after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. So here the angel is reaching out to the very eagerly moving John as the city descends. Now, this is a different, much better quality uh, illustration from that same Bamberg apocalypse. But just to give you another idea of the way a city is represented, this is the fallen city of Babylon, where it quite literally falls by falling upside down. In Spain, during that same period, there was a quite different culture called the Mozarabic culture. It's M-O-Z and then Arabic. Um, and that refers to the Christians and the Jews both who lived on the territory of Spain and, and Portugal, uh, uh, lived there during the period when the Arabs ruled. And the Arabs were um, quite tolerant of their, their faiths. And in that culture, there um, one monk, a man named Beatus, B-E-A-T-U-S, wrote a commentary on the book of Apocalypse. And his commentary was extremely popular and there are a number of manuscripts of it that survive. And this is a page from one, and this was produced in the middle of the 11th century. So you see the city and how now we have the, from the description, there are the apostles and each with the stone, their stones are mentioned by name above their heads, presented as if they were, well, just little globes over their halos. And there's the lamb, and here's the angel with the measuring rod or reed, and here is John who's receiving the revelation. And these are the walls, all laid out as a wonderfully, oh, it looks almost like a woven pattern, isn't it? 
Um, so it's a kind of a flattened aerial view and is a strong reminder of something characteristic of all, most of the art that we think of as from the medieval period, from around the fourth to 14th century, at least, that there was virtually no interest in showing the world the way it looks to our eyes, because I don't think even looking at this, you could say, oh, well, they didn't know, know how to do any better. There's an earlier period that there was certainly a loss of um, the tradition of, of representation in art. So there was a kind of a, a sag and there's a lot of clumsy work, but this is not clumsy. This is extremely elegant, certainly fits 20th century taste, 21st century taste. But here's the idea now I'm going to bring in. Why art? Why artists and the people who are paying for these books or commissioning these books and pouring over these books, why did they want this? Because to them, the real world is not the world here on earth. This is, it is like a diagram. What is, where you sit right now is simply a diagram, a kind of a transient, temporary, unreliable version of the reality. And the reality is in the world beyond here. Not, so anything that we perceive by our senses is, are, is just, our senses are there to just give us hints of how to reach toward reality. Um, now, what I find very interesting for myself this morning, I was listening to NPR um, and there was an interview with a doctor, I believe he was, a research, maybe a research doctor, who has been studying people who have had a whole history of near-death experiences, um, people of all religious backgrounds, this, their near-death experiences coming from a whole variety of sources, and this is from, it goes back to even ancient Greek times, and that there are continuities in their stories uh, and their reactions when they return from this experience is being similar to all of this sense of a world beyond, especially a light world light filled with a desire for a kind of a peace and community, often changing careers from what they had done before. So I thought it's the perception that prevailed in the Middle Ages is now recurring in something so this world grounded as National Public Radio. Well, here's another manuscript two years late, no, two decades later of, of that same Beatus uh, commentary. And this is from a, a complete apocalypse that's owned by the Morgan Library. It has a slightly different layout, but it's generally, you can see the similarities. Or I'll skip a lot later, go to Durr at the end of the 15th century in his woodcut apocalypse of 1498. The image most familiar to people is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But there was also this one where the angel is introducing John to the view of heavenly Jerusalem, which you see here as a medieval walled city with a cathedral within and an angel at the door. This um, manuscripts of the apocalypse were very, um, well, were relatively popular in the late 15th century because there was a strong strain of belief that the world was going to end in 1500. And so people were, were immensely interested in um, what the biblical story might tell them of what was to come. It's often, you know, just really quite um, 
well, sort of primitive. This is the middle of the 16th century. It's a colored woodcut by a German artist. Very, he illustrated a lot of books. But this is again a heavenly Jerusalem, a walled city. And now you see like that Bamberg apocalypse. And unlike the text of Saint um, in Revelation, it's a circular walled city. Notice, however, that they're either circles or squares, that they are what are considered the most perfect geometric shapes. Um, and then the temple here in the middle. Or another version. This is astonishing. And these are chairs where you could sit and look at the whole series of what's here. Uh, no, actually, here's a person's head. There's a group of people here. Um, it's, it's a series of tapestries that, that show the entire um, story of, I think, 90 scenes of the uh, apocalypse. This is the largest surviving cycle of uh, tapestries from the Middle Ages, and it's in the French, in a chateau in the French city of Angers, A-N-G-E-R-S. Probably it was, the thought is it was not meant to design, uh, decorate the interior of the chateau, which would be where often the tapestries would go, but that this uh, set up a, a jousting court, kind of hard to imagine that to me. And here's God showing to John the heavenly Jerusalem again as a walled city. All right, so those are deep depictions associated largely with uh, I mean, two-dimensional depictions. What about in architecture? I mean, we're talking about something that is architectural. Uh, this is the remnant of a monastic complex. It's just north of Milan. There's a church and an oratory and um, just some scraps of the original monastery called San Pietro in Civate. In the church part, There's a, a barrel vaulted um, central section. And here you see the apostles in a walled city and the lamb. Now it is combined also with the resurrected Christ here. But so, and there's the rivers of, the rivers also described in another part in in St. John is coming from the heavenly Jerusalem. This is heavenly Jerusalem. So as you are in church, it is right over you. So it can descend upon you, or you can think of yourself as ascending into that. And that is the big issue about in discussing the architecture. It is such a matter of the being in the eyes of the beholder, contemporary beholders, because the Medieval sources and, well, we never hear from the architects, but from the patrons or whatever we have, it's very seldom made explicit whether the buildings are thought to represent on earth, heavenly Jerusalem that has come down to you, or if you are looking at something that you are aspiring um, you, you lift yourself up into, into this, this metaphysical spiritual realm through looking at it. So, so whether it's top down or bottom up. So, that should be an interest of, oh yeah, we'll find out why it's interesting. But almost all churches at, um, or dedication services for churches, the traditional Roman Catholic dedication services or others, mention some analogy between the current terrestrial building and then either the Temple of Solomon or the whole heavenly Jerusalem. So for here, well, we're going completely out of the content of today, but that's the great church of Hagia Sophia from the early sixth century in Istanbul. And it, 
the view of sort of what it looks like now it, within. Um, originally, this was all shining marble down here, and this was all gold mosaic up here. And this was made under the Emperor Justinian in the space of five years. It was just what an assertion of power and wealth and devotion to God. And in the dedication ceremony, uh, which is, is on record, what Justinian said as he walked in here for the first time was, Solomon, I have surpassed thee. So this whole building was to be thought of as a new temple on earth. So now for the remainder of the time, we're gonna look at um, Romanesque and Gothic churches. Uh, those uh, Romanesque, the, the name is just based on the fact that the architecture uses, the buildings use round arches like Roman architecture. Uh, and that's a period from, it's based on, it's given its date really based on the art rather than anything else. It's about mm, late 10th, 11th centuries. And you're looking at um, a church of Saint Foy or Saint Faith in the Southern French city of Conque. C-O-N-Q-U-E-S. Had I my way, every one of you would go to see this. That's one view of the town. And here you're looking at, it's, it's just a small town um, in a mountainous region. And you see how the church is dominant over it. Why would a small town was never more extensive than this. Need a church of that size? Well, it doesn't. But this church was one of a series built along the main paths that pilgrims took when they were going to make their uh, pilgrimage to um, San Santiago de Compostela to see where St. James was supposedly buried. And along the route, uh, the surviving pilgrims guides tell us they say, well, don't go here. Thieves are really bad there. Watch out for the food here. And then stop at this church, stop at this church. This has this relic, this has this relic. And the churches that had relics that were of um, great fame, of course, people came, they stayed. There's tourist dollars. There were devotional offerings. The towns prospered, shall we say, off that, as did the church. And the church at Conk had a very famous relic, which I restrained myself from bringing in, but of a, a relic of a young girl's skull, uh, St. Faith, who supposedly in the fourth century died for her faith. She refused to recant from her Christian conversion and she was imprisoned and then she was killed. And she became the patron saint of anybody who works with metal because she was chained up. The monks who had a um, monastery here had made a very daring raid and stolen the relics of the saint from someplace else. Um, the relic is, consists of her skull. Well, it turns out to be an adult skull. It's, it's definitely not the real saint faith. And it's a marvelous relic because it shows a little girl seating in a chair. She's in gold and the whole thing is just encased in gems. So people coming from Scandinavia and from England and then from Northern France would on their way down before they head across the current route, um, pilgrims route to Santiago would stop here at this church. So here it is now. And what you mainly have is a sense of something of tremendous bulk and majesty and power. Uh, it's a very plain structure. But if you were to think in modern practicalities, 
What do you need all that for? The interior. Um, during the World Wars, the original glass was all lost. It probably, most of it was white or might have been um, some panels of alabaster. There might have been a little color, but not much colored glass and not really very many windows. But this tremendous lofty space as you come in and you look down toward the altar and the relic of St. Faith would be down here. So what is this space for? Well, the Gregorian chant is made to resound and echo according to the intervals in uh, spaces like this. But these churches weren't made for Gregorian chant. This really does represent a kind of an idea of lifting off uh, a sort of a, the heavenly sense. There was no decoration up here, uh, no fresco like there was you saw before, but it's the building itself that lifts you literally out of yourself so that by um, sensual experience really, you, you transcend ordinary life. Do you see, it is also extremely, even inside you have the idea that there's great weight. And then here's the door on the west where <clears throat> there's an explicit message. Um, this also ties in with uh, those of you who uh, attended the lecture on um, the class on Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel and the Last Judgment. Because here you have a Last Judgment in a very traditional place, which is on the exterior of the church. So that in the square right in front, which is where market day would generally be held, anybody going about or anybody going about any time during the week would be reminded of the perils of the succumbing to the temptations to sin by showing the life in heaven and the life in hell. So here is figures who are coming to be judged and they are all very neatly lined up. Uh, royalty, clergy, pilgrims, bishop, and then local people to very humble local people. Here's St. Faith squeezed in here in her little prison chamber. Angels helping, so solicitously helping the dead rise and heaven. And heaven is harmony, neatness, order, and a Romanesque church. See? With its towers and its rounded arches. So that visually makes explicit the message that you internalize when you go in. They do look very happy. And hell, in contrast, is chaos. People of all the various kinds of sins are shown here. This is a, one matter a great deal on the site because that's a miser. He's hanging on his money bags. So anybody who's been cheating in the market ought to think about it. Here's a couple caught in adultery. Here's a knight being pulled down by a demon. That's a pride goes before a fall. There's this horse. So especially in France, the, the, that, um, it's, it's a very grand one, but Conk is an example of what those first very large churches of an increasingly prosperous country and prosperous um, church uh, um, 
the ones that they were creating. Now we leap ahead almost a century and move back toward Paris, just north of Paris, to the church of Saint-Denis, Saint and then D-E-N-I-S, which is generally credited with being the very first Gothic church. I'll come back to this image in a moment. Here it is. Now this has suffered terrible vicissitudes, but we'll look at what there is from the time of its creation. So um, Denis, D-E-N-I-S, was the patron saint of France. Uh, he supposedly uh, was buried on this site and this was a very, for, for centuries, a very important Christian site. Uh, for example, the first emperor Charlemagne dedicated a church here. And it became the area where the French kings were buried. For example, Marie Antoinette is buried in here. Um, so it's, it's a repository, and it has this connection with royalty. And the church was well used and well worn when a very enterprising, spectacularly gifted abbot named Abbot Suger, which is S U G E R, came to power and he uh, worked on rebuilding it. I'm going to read you some of what he wrote and then we'll look at the building as well. But here is Abbot Suger presenting one of the stained glass windows. Is often credited with the creation of Gothic style and architecture and the flourishing of stained gas windows. Well, now he'd made neither one of those personally, but he encouraged the most modern work and it was simply called the modern style. And it was his vision, his acumen, his wealth, his organizational skills that helped to bring it all together here at Saint-Denis. The part that Suger himself was responsible for is this facade. Of course, it's now missing a tower. And then the area back around the apse. And all this is a later, later work, um, <clears throat> the next century, the middle of the 13th century. I, I have a lot I would like to read from him. But we ought to need to see the pictures. So his, this is the mid 12th century, it was just a little bit back there, a little later than the 12th, mid. And then typical, we now say typical Gothic interior. How very different from Conk from just a hundred years earlier. Of course, the grand question is why? Why should there be this enormous change? Now, there are Romanesque churches that have what are the hallmarks of Gothic style? Pointed arches. Uh, and there are also some Romanesque churches that have some stained glass. But to bring them together in this new combination, this new formulation, is the fame of Suger and of this particular church. doing this here. So there, just look at that difference. This is raises then my, my question to you. You see, this is um, where modern architectural historians, the ones who do more than work out just the statics, how does this building stand exactly like this? How precisely it was made? Those who are concerned with why was it made this way? What does it mean? Um, this is where that comes in. It, do you have a sense of this as does one have a sense of this? When you go in as a building that makes you sort of shed a sense of yourself and through spiritual contemplation, 
you're sort of surrendering also to sense impressions. Feel that you're moved out of this world so that you are, in a sense, entering a heavenly Jerusalem when you move into this building. Or not. That's why you have to go. Well, Sujay explained in, he, he wrote a lot about what he did. Oh, he, he was a man of, of, of parts and he, he even ruled France for a while while the king was off on a, the second crusade. Um, but Sujay wrote about why he had this church built and what his intentions were. Um, and this is, this is back from Conk. This is just a, the best I could do for the, there are a series of little chapels behind the main altar and they all had relics in them. So when all the pilgrims would come to see saint Foy, of course they would wanna go by here and see, oh, be closer to whose ever relics were here and there. It would be very crowded sometimes and noisy, people going through while church was going on. And, and uh, for Sujay, he wanted something where more people could move more freely to display more relics. And for that, he got architects who used pointed arches and created this. That's a very grand space. See the altar would be main altars back about over, over, over here where my pointer is. So we were just standing back in here. So that, the windows, vast windows, almost no wall, and a sense of just space. Nothing of real weight, nothing of great ponderous weight that you would guess from the actual scale of the structure. I better, well, let's, uh, let's just, uh, so that I do all the reading in this, this particular day. Um, because in Sujay's writing, I think you, well, we get some sense at least of his frame of mind, his, his, his pattern of thinking. Uh, he explains why he, the existing church, he decided needed to have changes made to it, partly because it was old and it was falling apart and he was having the walls restored. And then he, he said, uh, even while this was being carried out at great expense, uh, this renovation project, because of the inadequacy we often, we often felt on special days, such as the feast day of the blessed Dennis, the fair and many other times, when the narrowness of the place forced women to run to the altar on the heads of men as on a pavement with great anguish and confusion. Now, how is that for making your case saying, oh, the place is too small, too crowded. Women, when they come for these great days, it's like, you know, you're in the mosh pit. <laughs> women have to climb across the heads of men to even get up toward the altar. So, uh, that's not, kind of hard to believe that. Um, and for this reason, moved by in divine inspiration, and encouraged by the counsel of wise men, as well as the prayers of many monks. And in order to avoid the displeasure of the holy martyrs, that's of the dead, you see, I undertook to enlarge and amplify the noble monastic church consecrated by divine hand, devoutly praying in church that he who is the beginning and the end, now we're talking about God, he who is the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega, should join a good end with a good beginning by way of a sound middle. Now, what's he talking about there? Well, he designed, I mean, he paid for the area down at the apse and the entrance. So he designed the good end first, and then he did the good beginning. And then he wasn't sure in his lifetime, the good middle, what you're mainly looking at here would be done. Um, and that, um, let's see, well, that, that part, I want you to know. And then he describes also at one stage when the um, 
arches were just being put up. There was a terrible storm evidently in the area. And he said, uh, <clears throat> the storm it, uh, threatened um, the, 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 of these arches. They threatened bail for ruin at any minute, miserably trembling and as it were swaying hither and thither because they weren't you know, locked in place by other structures yet. And the tempest, while it brought calamitous ruin in many places to buildings thought to be firm, in the end was unable to damage these isolated and newly made arches because it was repulsed, repulsed by the power of God. So it's God who needs this built, who God encourages, God ensures its safety. And Suchet and the unknown architects who had the wit to figure out how it could be done. And one is to make good use of a slightly different construction system. I hope this is a distant memory for many of you from high school and college because it began, oh, it makes use of the pointed arch. Now, what's the, the big hurrah about the pointed arch? But one thing, when there were uh, spaces made by sort of um, ceilings that were barrel-shaped units that intersected at right angles, if they were, this would be semicircular and this was semicircular, um, the semicircle that went across on the diagonal, of course, is going to rise much higher than the, the ones across the side. And if you imagine what it's like under here, you'd go along, there's a kind of a low arch, then whoop, the high one that goes low, and then whoop, high again. So you'd have a discontinuous sense of the ceiling, which can be quite distracting if your goal is to be down toward the altar. Uh, where the service is being um, conducted. And also, it's kind of weird because you get a little light over here and then be dark in here and then light and dark. It's a really a staccato pattern. If, however, you use pointed arches and you just pull the point up so that all the arches rise to the, same, the height of the one at the center, you can have a continuous flow all the way down and the spaces it covers can be wide or very narrow or not even rectangular. So you can have, oh, and then there's another very great advantage. The closer the arch is to a perpendicular, the more the weight just comes easily down here. You don't need to have extra reinforcement against the areas in a semicircular arch where the forces are so great that this, this is where they tend to collapse to the ground. So it's stronger. And as it's stronger, you don't need to use as much material. So it's stronger, lighter, and has a kind of visual consistency and a flexibility that the round arch used in the Romanesque period did not have. Hmm. I'm seeing we have two minutes, so I'm right. I'm talk about the principles. We'll just, I think you should go out with some of the images. Then I'll come back with that and, and then I'll be doing the Renaissance next time. Here you are. I don't know. You, you have to imagine you are now lying on the altar there at, at Saint Denis and looking up. So, with the ribs in the pointed arches, you can have a system that looks like, this is just like a, a skin, a, a light fabric stretched across here. There's no weight. And there's certainly no wall. Nothing's carrying down the wall because all the weight just goes over to the corners and then comes down. So the building looks as good as weightless. And if you also use 
flying buttresses instead of supporting them with heavy wall just where the weight does come, but pushing it by buttresses further out, you can have big windows. And you can have windows with stained glass. So that when the light shining in through that glass, the walls picking up the color are like the jeweled city described in John's vision with jacinth and amethyst and topaz and chrysoprase and all those other gems. So again, it becomes like a heavenly Jerusalem. So do a little, well, some more with that and then we will do Renaissance structures next week. And of course, if you have comments and questions, I'm very happy to entertain them. Uh, is there anyone want me to continue to um, showing any images? Is there any image you want to look at again? Could you go back to the condensed ski near the beginning, Maggie? Oh, yeah. yeah, we'll have a lightning tour. You can look and say, oh, I remember seeing that. Oh, yeah, I saw that before. <laughs> there. Um, it seems to remind me a lot of Chagall, and I was wondering if they influenced each other. They knew each other. They even taught together for a while. Um, the they horse. profoundly disagreed, but yes, there is a commonality. Yeah. It, it, it's not like a, a direct influence, but this is sort of, it all sort of grows out of that interest in Russian folk art at the beginning of the 20th century that they both drew on that. Okay, anybody else want to look at an image of anything? No? All right, let's see what's up in the chat. Uh, why did they think the world would end in 1500? I have no idea mystic or whoever thought of that. But that certainly is the time, you know, when the tumult and the division between the developing Protestant faiths and the Roman Catholic authority was going on. So there just may have been a sense that uh, as today, things were just bad, that, that it was going to, something had to change. I'm, I'm winging that, but there have to have been one or two preachers who really got it started. Anything more? All right then, I'll pick this up next week.